everyone and welcome to your first lecture video. This video is the lecture video that accompanies a set of notes for section 1.1, which is your first lecture. Um, it should be posted by this Wednesday and the homework assignment that will accompany it, which I will go over with you at the end of this video, is already posted on the task tab of our Blackboard course and is due by this Friday um, prior to our live session. Hopefully, I will also have a video posted for you by this Friday for Friday's lecture, um, as well as the homework assignment, as I'm hoping to use our live class sessions instead of making them lectures, but to give you the opportunity to ask me questions about homework assignments or things, concepts that you may not have understood, or if I can help you troubleshoot anything that you might be having a difficult time with right now as you're adjusting to this online learning platform. All right, now that we've got that housekeeping out of the way, let's get to our class. Now, hopefully I am not going to have technology issues. I'm going to start sharing my screen with you, and I'm hoping to do so without too much difficulty. So let's see how we do here. see my notes here. I'm going to try to reorient my screen here so that you can get a better view. There we go. All right, and uh, I hope that also at this point you have picked up the textbook that needs to accompany this course. Um, it is listed on your syllabus. It should have been listed on your course description on your bulletin, but this is the textbook that you need for this course. It is expensive. My apologies for that. Um, but if you are pursuing um, the certification for elementary education, if you're going in that direction, then you will find that it is going to be useful for you since um, you will use it not only for this course, but you will also use it for the companion course to this, which is Math 117. So you will actually get two course, uh, full courses out of this one textbook, so it will in the long run be worth the money that you invest, but it is relatively expensive. So I'm sorry for that. It is, however, the required textbook for this course. So hopefully you already have it because I do refer to you, um, refer to it very much, and also your homework assignments come directly out of the textbook. So you are going to be able, um, you are going to need to be able to access it in order to do the homework assignments. So today we're in, uh, we're beginning our lectures by introducing problem solving. Problem solving is a very basic mathematical skill and not only mathematical but life skill that we all need to establish and unfortunately we only teach it in math. So not only is it important that you have a strong understanding of what it entails to be an effective problem solver when you are specifically talking about solving mathematical problems, but also because it is the only course that you will teach to your students wherein they will be taught how to think this way when it comes to solving problems, whether they are mathematical or otherwise. It is the only time that you get taught how to logically think through what is your problem, what do you have, what resources are available to you, how can you employ them in order to reach the solution that you're looking for, which is basically what problem solving is. This is where we teach it. And Hoya, who um, was a mathematician, is the one who sort of helped to boil it down to those sort of simple steps, and here they are. So you are going to be responsible for knowing these. Hoya's four steps to problem solving, okay? The first thing that it's important for you to note, and that's why you see that I have highlighted it in red, is that in this, for this purposes of this course in your textbook, we make a strong differentiation between what is an exercise and what is a problem. Okay, in accordance to this book, an exercise is where you apply a routine procedure uh, to arrive at an answer. This would be when you already understand the concept of addition and subtraction and you're just given a whole bunch of addition and subtraction problems to solve. That's an exercise. You're not employing problem solving skills there. You already know what to do. You're simply practicing skills that you've already acquired. For the purposes of our course and for the textbook, a problem is referred to as when you have to pause you're pausing, you're reflecting, and perhaps you're even taking original steps in order to arrive at a solution. So a problem is when you 
don't necessarily have all the skill sets required in order to solve that problem. You now have to look at it, analyze it, break it down, and try to come up with a plan to solve it. And sometimes, even in math, you're having to come up with new and creative ways to figure out how to get to that solution. So please note that the distinction between what constitutes an exercise or what constitutes a problem really comes down to your state of mind. Meaning, if you're already comfortable with the concepts that are being discussed, then most likely when you're practicing those concepts in problem form, they will feel more like exercise to you or to your students. But if they are not familiar with the concepts that are being used or the skill sets that are required, and it is their first exposure, then when they're being asked to practice those concepts in problem form, it will feel more like a problem. Hence why it's important that both you understand what it requires to problem solve and that you can teach your students what it requires to problem solve, okay? So, for example, okay, and we see here my example. Um, if we look here, okay, and here's my example. I use this as my abbreviation for example. We are looking at three plus two, okay? For you, and sorry, I'm marking up my board here. For you, three plus two would be considered an exercise because you are no longer learning the concept of how do we do addition problems? What are fact families in addition? This are, these are things that you're no longer learning. You just look at three plus two, you know what to do. This would be an exercise for you. It would just be repeating skill sets that you already have. But for a kindergartner in your classroom, should you be teaching kindergarten, this would be a problem. It would be required for them to look at it, analyze it, reflect on it, perhaps learn original steps on how to arrive at a solution for this problem. So for your kindergartner, because of their state of mind or their lack of knowledge, it becomes a problem, not an exercise, okay? So please note that knowing that difference does not mean that one is more valuable than the other. If you'll notice here on my note, Okay, it says that doing exercises are valuable, okay, they are valuable because they help you learn concepts, properties, and procedures, or rather practice, remember, recall, and push them into long-term memory. And they can help you to have those exercises, those basic skills have to be there so that you can then apply them when you're actually faced with a problem you need to solve. Okay, for example, that is the reason why, as elementary school teachers, it is so important when teaching math that the basic building blocks of math are taught very clearly, very strongly, and that those are embedded in the long-term memory of your students, because as they progress through their mathematical education, if they don't have those basic building blocks at an exercise level, then they won't have them to use as tools and resources when they're actually faced with problems that they need to employ those basic skills into. For example, you get to algebra, if, uh, if addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, fact families, fractions are not something that you are solid on and that you could work on at an exercise level, then you won't have them readily accessible to you when you're trying to work on an algebraic problem that requires you to draw on that information in order to solve that problem. So let's look at that four-step process that George Paulia came up with, okay? Step one, you are to understand the problem, okay? This means that you have to look at the problem, break it down slowly, and be able to understand what the problem is talking about. You'll see here that I made a little note to myself, discuss the internal questions that you see on page five. So if you will turn, to page five on your textbook, okay, you'll find that there's some questions that you need to ask yourself when you're working on these, okay? For you, you're, you're probably very familiar um, with what kinds of questions you would be asking yourself if you're trying to make sure you understand the problem. But it's important that you can vocalize these because you have to model that for students in your classroom. For example, you have to ask yourself things like, do you understand all the words? Can you restate the problem in your own words? Uh, do you know what information has been given to you already? Do you know what 
solution you're looking for? What is your goal at the end of this problem when you're done solving it? What is it you're hoping to find, right? Um, do you have enough information to be able to get to the solution? Um, is there any information that they gave you that you really don't need so you can sort of just get rid of it so it doesn't confuse you? Um, you know, is this problem similar to something up that you've done before that you can probably draw on that experience to help guide you in this one? These are the kind of internal questions you want to be asking yourself. Um, again, you can reference those on page five in your textbook if you want to include those in your notes, okay? So that's the step one. You need to make sure that you understand the problem. And I find that modeling these internal questions as well as a very basic thing really helps your students to learn how to do this first step, which is really important. And that is to tell your students or tell yourself, slow down, okay? A lot of us, because we happen to be good readers, will take sit down to read a math problem and we read right through it like we were reading the first paragraph of the novel and it's not the same. You need to slow down, read each sentence carefully while using all those internal questions we just talked about to make sure that you are clearly understanding what is being said, what do you have, what do you need to find, okay? So I would just put in there, I would additionally say that it is important when you are making sure that you understand your problem that you slow down. So I'm going to put that up here for you as well. So I think it's important that you slow down while reading, okay? So I'm going to do a little backslash while reading. Because that helps you to make sure that you can have time to go through those internal questions as you're processing the information. Step two, of course, is to devise a plan. This is to use a strategy. Now there is a list at the bottom of that self same page on page five. You can see here that I have uh, listed it for you at the bottom of page five and also at the top of page six, they list about 21 different strategies that are discussed in this textbook. We're not gonna discuss all of them. You won't even discuss all of them when you reach uh, Math 117 but it's good for you to be familiar with them, okay? And what we are gonna talk about, okay, are the first few strategies that we can use. We're gonna talk about, um, I think about three or four of them that we're gonna discuss. So you devise a strategy. This is where you come up with a plan. Do I need to do addition? Do I need to do subtraction? Do I need to do multiplication or division or a combination of it? Is this a multi-step problem? So I need to do one strategy and then followed by another strategy. This here in step two is where you would come up with that plan, okay? Step three is of course to carry out that plan, right? This, um, if you look at page six in your textbook, they discuss how you would carry out the plan. This is important because this is also where when problem solving in life, not just in math class, is where we sometimes fall down. You need to remember that once you figured out what the problem is, you make sure that you understand what it is and you make sure that you understand what it is you need to be able to get to in order to solve that problem. You have to come and you come up with a plan of this is what I could do to solve it. You have to make sure that you then implement it. Otherwise you just stagnate and nothing happens, right? So you've got to implement the strategies that you've decided you could use to help you in this process. You have to give yourself a reasonable amount of time in order to be able to solve this problem. And it's never ever be afraid to get started, get halfway there and then go, oh wait, you know what? I'm not finding that this plan is really working efficiently. Let me go back and start again with a different plan. So it is important that you do those things, but you must carry it out. And in life, this is also very important. You come up with a plan for your life, you figure out what you're going to do, you start the process, you need to implement it. And don't be afraid to talk to other people about it. Don't forget to, don't be afraid to have to go, oh, you know what, I thought I was doing this right, but this is not working out. Let me regroup and restart. Don't give up on um, getting to the solution, but maybe you have to come up with a different plan and then implement it, carry it out and so forth, okay? Last but not least, we have step four, which is where you should look back. Uh, mathematically speaking, this is where you check. This is where you make sure that your answer makes sense in the context of the problem that you're working with. Life speaking, this is where you evaluate if you got to where you wanted to get to, okay? So here is a way that you can sort of think about it visually, okay? We start with the original problem. 
And then usually with a word problem, you get the, the original problem, it's written out, you read it, and then you have to translate it into some sort of mathematical version of that problem. So this is where you need to read the problem and figure out, write out your, your number sentence, write out your equation, depending on what you're working with. You need to be able to translate it into some sort of mathematical version of the problem that's gonna then allow you to do it. Now, once you've got that, you implement the skill sets that you have to solve it, okay? So you go ahead and you solve that problem, which then leads you to a solution that's in mathematical language, right? Because you either add it and you have a number or you solved an equation and you have an answer equal to a variable. Whatever the case may be, you now have a solution after you've implemented this mathematical version of it, right? But you're not finished because in a word problem, once you get to the answer, you still have to be able to interpret it in the context of the problem, okay? so that you can basically answer the problem that you were asked in the word problem. For example, and then of course, last but not least, you always make sure that you check it to make sure that it makes sense in comparison to that original problem. So for example, the word problem says, little Johnny has three apples, his friend Mark has two, they wanna know how many apples they have all together. That's the original problem then you would translate that problem to an actual mathematical equation. So this is where you would go, okay, little Johnny has three apples. I'm sorry, my pen messed up here. Three apples and his friend Mark has two. They wanna know what is all together. So that means I'm doing addition. There we go. I've translated my problem into a mathematical version. Now I go ahead and I solve it. Three plus two is five. So now I have my answer in a mathematical version. But I now need to interpret it in order to answer my problem. The interpretation is Johnny and Mark have five apples all together. Okay? So that's basically the concept of what's happening here as far as how you apply those four steps to solving a problem. Okay? Now, Let's look at one of the first strategies that your students will use as well as you. And here it is. The first strategy would be guess and test. This is when you present them with a problem that they're not familiar with. Uh, you may not have introduced any additional basic skills other than what they already know based on where they're at in their education, in their development, whatever the case may be. And you say, here's this problem. We want to get to this solution. How do you think you could do it? And most of the time, both adults, but a lot uh, children particularly, will approach it by going guess and test. Be like, okay, um, let's try this and see if that works. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try that and see if that works. Oops, that didn't work, right? Now, every strategy that we're gonna talk about or any strategy that you may look at has its most efficient situation in which it should be applied, okay? If you can use any strategy you want, but depending on the kind of problem that you're talking about, some strategies are more effective and therefore more efficient for that particular problem. So this strategy here, guess and test, has actually three iterations of it. You've got your random guess and test, okay? Which basically means that you're just gonna try it randomly no matter what. Oh, and I think my pen just died, fabulous. Okay, so we'll try this with my finger here. So you have your random guess and test, okay? And then you have your systematic. This would be where you say to yourself, okay, let's try this first, then we'll try that, then we'll try that, then we'll try that in, in order. Um, and then you have your inferential. And this is where you're like, if I try this, that leaves me with these options. So do those options work for me? Because if not, then let me try something else instead, okay? So when is it appropriate to use a guess and test strategy? That's what we're looking at right here. It is appropriate to use it when the number of possible answers that you can guess and test are limited. So obviously in a kind of problem where you can have an unlimited number of potential answers or a large number of potential answers, guess and test would be tedious, it would take too long, it would not be efficient, and so therefore it would not be appropriate to use that strategy in that particular type of problem. So when you have a limited number of possible answers, 
the guess and test is potentially a good strategy to use for problem solving. If you have a good idea of what the answer should be and you kind of just are trying to work out some minor quirks, then that might be a good time to apply the guess and test strategy. If you can systematically try several possibilities to get to the answer in a relatively efficient um, amount of time, then that also helps. And if your choices can be narrowed down by you employing other strategies first, so that you can then make it appropriate to use guess and test. So that means that perhaps at the start, guess and test might not have been your best choice for a strategy, but if you can then use other strategies that narrow down your, your possibilities so that now you do have a limited number of possible answers, now you can use guess and test to sort of bring it home, okay? Here's an example of what we can do. On page eight of your textbook, they give you something, and I'm just gonna slide up because I have an example of it right here. They give you something that looks like this. Let's see if we can get it all in the picture there. There we go. So they give you something that looks like this. And on page eight of your textbook, they basically say, okay, so here's the thing. You can use the numbers one through six, okay? But you must place them into this triangle so that Along any one side, we have this side. I'm going to try to tell you can see better. So along any one side, down that side, or this side, the sum of all three dots will be 12. And then whatever numbers you put here, the sum of these three dots will be 12. And the sum of these three dots will be 12. Okay, and the numbers that you have available to use are only one through six. So that means that you have one, two, three, four, five, and six. Those are your only options to put inside this, these circles, but however you arrange them, the three along the blue side of the triangle must add up to 12, the three along the pink side of the triangle must add up to 12, and the three along the bottom side of the triangle must add up to 12. So here is a problem where you could use any one of the three different kinds of guess and test that we discussed. You could use the random guess and test approach where you just randomly start putting numbers and see if it adds up to 12 and just go, okay, how about I just do uh, one, uh, let me put a number, here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, and then see how that works out, okay? And if I add up, I've got one and two, that's three, three and three, that's six, that didn't work over here, so that was a fail, right? Three and four, that's seven, seven and five is 12, that one worked, but five and six is 11, and one's 12 worked on this side too, but something's wrong over here, okay? So we could do that and then try to see what we can rearrange to make it work a little bit better, everybody understand? Okay, so that would be your random, we could do it that way. Now, we could also, and let me put my lines back here so we can keep track of what we're doing. Okay, we could also try the systematic guess and test. This is where we would say, okay, if we do one on this corner here and we go one, we can do one plus two and three. We already said that didn't work, so we're not gonna try two and three. What if we do one, th uh, uh, one three, and four, and see if that works. Three, four, five, six, and put two over here. Check that, that didn't work. Then we would try it again with a, a, with a different situation, okay? So that would be where you're doing your systematic guess and test. And then the third approach would be if you did an inferential, where you would pick a number and say, okay, if I pick one to be in this corner, and I know that each side must add to 12, then that means that I know these two, okay, must equal 11, right? Whatever they are, they must equal 11 when I add them together. Same is true for these two, right? They must equal 11 when I add them together, whatever I choose to put there, okay? And then obviously these three, still have to equal 12. So then I look and see, okay, I can no longer use one because I've placed one somewhere. The numbers I have left to work with are two, three, four, five, and six. So if I have to add up to 11, well, six and five add up to 11, so I could put a six, so 
All right, you can see that. I can put a six and a five here. That adds up to 11. But those are the only ones that do. And if I already use them, right, that leaves me two, three, and four. And those will not add up to 11 no matter what I do, which means I will not be able to do what I need to do down here. Okay, and there's no telling what's going to happen here because I've already used up my best bet for 11 with the six and five. So clearly having one in the corner, not going to work. I need to try something different, right? And then you might pick, okay, let me see what happens if I put a two in the corner and work from there or a three in a corner and work from there. That would be inferential guess and test, okay? So as just a little added bonus, if you guys want to try this at home, this is included in the notes. It's going to be in the notes that I'm going to put on the link for you. So you can definitely um, try it at home and see if you can figure it out. I can, uh, the answer is in your textbook on page nine. So you can always check it and see how that worked out. Okay. So that is a way that you can apply inferential guess and test. Now, if we move back here to the notes where we left off, and I'm going to zoom these in so that you can see them a little bit better. There we go. Okay. Other strategies that we can do. So that was guess and test. Other strategies we can do is draw a picture. I find that these are particularly useful when you're doing geometric um, geometry problems, things uh, or things when you're when you're introducing things like area, perimeter, or any of the formulas in geometry for like uh, the area of a triangle or for an equilateral, things of that nature. Because when you can visually see the picture, it helps you to sort of identify where information is. It's also very helpful when you're talking about scale models, when you're talking about ratios. Um, so drawing a picture is a useful strategy. And here are the times when it is appropriate. Drawing, uh, drawing a strategy is appropriate when there's a physical situation involved, hence why things like geometry is useful. It's also good when uh, you use geometrical figures and measurements, like I just mentioned before. And it's also good when you need to have a visual representation of the problem to be able to better understand what you need to do and how you can get to the solution, okay? Third strategy that we're gonna discuss for this lecture is using a variable. Now this one, the only cautionary tale that I give you is that this is useful when you have a basic algebraic understanding of math, okay? Because you, in order to use a variable, you have to have an understanding of algebra. So this is a strategy that obviously uh, your older students would be able to use once they've had some basic understanding of algebra. Um, and here are the times when it would be effective. It's more appropriate to use this strategy when uh, you hear phrases similar to for any number um, that is present or implied in that particular problem when the problem suggests the use of an equation in order to solve it, uh, when you need a proof or general solution is required for that could be applied to all situations similar to the problem that you've been given, when the problem contains phrases like consecutive, even, odd, or whole numbers, those are usually key phrases telling you that coming up with some form of formula would be most useful, when you have uh, this large number of possible cases that could potentially be solutions to your problem, when there is an unknown quantity that is related to known quantities and you're being asked to find that unknown quantity, that is the most obvious time when you need to use a variable um, strategy solution, when there's an infinite number of solutions possible, uh, when you're trying to develop a general formula to apply to various other types of problems that would have similar parameters. So to be effective though, so please note the note that I wrote for you here, okay? To be effective, students must understand what a variable is and have the ability to write equations. So again, this is obviously not a strategy that you would use with your young ones, you know, your first, second, third graders. This is not where you go with that. Although with the newer uh, math that was being used a couple years back in the schools, they were starting to gently introduce this concept so that it, when it came time to use uh, a variable as a strategy for problem solving. It was a little easier for students to jump on that bandwagon. Okay, so now your homework for tonight. I'm going to go ahead and stop the share here at this point. Okay, let's see if it'll stop it for you. There we go. So your homework for tonight is the homework listed as homework one on your task tab. 
It is assigned as of tomorrow, which is Wednesday the 26th, and it will be due on Friday the 28th. It will be due by class time. So at 1 p.m. when we have our live Zoom class, the homework at that point should already have been submitted. Um, I'm going to have a Dropbox in the same uh, spot where you're going to find this video and the link to the notes that I'm going to give you so that you have my, my notes that you can also use or the notes that you yourself took as you're listening to this video. Um, you can, in that same spot in the content area of our Blackboard course, you will have the Dropbox link available for you to submit your homework. Now, I have no problem you using notebook paper to write it out. You must make sure that it's neat, that it is easily clearly labeled and easily easy for you to read and follow with the homework. You need to um, make sure that when you submit it, the only document formats that Blackboard accepts without difficulty is if you use uh, GIF or JPEG format or Word document. Those are the ones that it accepts without giving you a hard time for submission. So I just recommend that you try to make sure that you're using one of those formats for the document. But do, uh, most of my students uh, last spring semester when we first started having to do this online situation would take pictures of it with their phone, which uh, I think automatically made them into JPEGs and then would submit those pictures as their assignment. That would then automatically pop up on my end of Blackboard for me to be able to look at grade and then have that uh, post directly to the grade book on Blackboard as well. Okay? Again, if you've got any questions, always feel free to reach out. Use my email that is in the syllabus that was posted for this course. All right, the homework is there. It's already there. Like I said, it's homework number one on the task table. It is page 18, numbers one, three and four, six and seven, and eight. Um, but should you have any difficulties, it's, like I said, it's already posted there on the task tab, so you should have no problem finding the homework assignment. Um, I look forward to meeting you all sort of in person when we have our Zoom meeting at 1 p.m. on Friday. I'll be posting the link for it probably most likely by Thursday evening so that you have no difficulties accessing it at 1 p.m. on Friday. Okay, so have a wonderful evening, day, or whatever time you're watching this video, and I will see you on Friday. Have a great day.